Hello, and welcome back to Future Tunes, where we explore the intersection of retrofuturism and animation by looking at past depictions of the future, seen in cartoons. Today, we are taking a trip to the UK with some animated series, as well as other British media that look towards the future, British retrofuturism, if you will. <laughs> now, uh, so much of what we look at in this series, or otherwise, comes from America, post-war America, a past brimming with optimism, We've also hit up Japan, the Soviet Union, and even China. Like I always say, retrofuturism is less about the future and more the past. While there are some similarities, different countries' futures are unique, informed by their culture and experience. I just mentioned the war, World War II, as it obviously had a massive impact, not only on the 20th century, but also the futures predicted by its participants. Coming out of World War II, again, American optimism, an impossibly comfortable and convenient future, in anime or other Japanese media, we get a lot of total destruction, rebuilding Neo-Tokyo, processing the atomic bomb, and uh, who could forget <laughs> the uh, melancholic, I guess, optimism of Soviet futurism. Like America, having won the war, the future Britain was largely bright. Both in newsreels and in television programs looking forward, there was peace, no war, their predictions were more rooted in reality. Cell phones, or as they are called here, radio telephones, communicating through satellites. I found this great clip of the television of tomorrow, accurately predicting flat screen TVs, as well as home video, video cassettes, video banking, a teller sits inside an ATM and communicates with customers via screen, which sounds convenient for everyone but the teller. In terms of urban planning and development, where the US had GM's Futurama, the UK had Motopia, the city of tomorrow. This was designed by architect Jeffrey Jellicoe in the late 1950s. Despite its name, Motopia was being marketed as a utopia for pedestrians. It was to be a residential community just outside of London where roads would be elevated above the buildings that were insulated against noise <laughs> with separate moving walkways for pedestrians, kind of like the original Epcot. And just like that Epcot, Motopia would never come to fruition. Looking at some of the darker or dystopian visions of future Britain, in 1932, Aldous Huxley published his novel, Brave New World, which forecasted a future where humans were engineered genetically and socially. They are grown in labs and assigned social roles from birth. There was also George Orwell's 1984, which imagined a world of mass surveillance and information control. Uh, whether appropriately or not, because of this book, the term Orwellian has been used to describe the world we are currently living in, uh, the so-called post-truth world. Both of these are classics of literature and have been adapted into TV or film many times, making them ideal candidates for a Patreon series feature film. Support us if you can, patreon.com slash pixandportraits. This series, though, is about cartoons, uh, or animation, and I'd like to look at a few series in particular. The first has its roots in print, Eagle, a weekly comics magazine. This is where Dan Dare, Pilot of the Future, debuted in 1950. We are not far removed from the war. All over the globe, stories of heroism on the battlefield dominated the screen. Veterans, who only really knew military life, had their experience dramatized, with certain archetypes emerging. Dan Dare would embody or embrace these. It took your quintessential British war hero and transplanted him into the future, into space. This strip was created by Frank Hampson and was set in the 1990s, where other planets have been explored and colonized. Space travel is no different than uh, train. Uh, lots of really great spaceship designs here on land. People travel by monorail. Uh, the stories are obviously science fiction, similar to what you would have seen in the American pulps. Dan Dare actually has been called Britain's answer to Buck Rogers. He remained a popular character well past those early strips, and even into the future they predicted. Here we are seeing a mobile ad he appeared in uh, during the 1980s. Dan Dare also got his own video game on the Commodore 64. Elton John even sung a song about him. In 2002, Dan Dare was adapted into animation, computer animation. This series was produced by Netter Digital and later Foundation Imaging. If this animation style looks familiar, both these studios also worked on Max Steel and the special effects for Babylon 5, for you sci-fi fans out there. I've talked about this a lot recently, but the idea that CGI was the future and that it lent itself very well to futuristic science fiction. I have not watched all 26 episodes, but from what I've seen, there isn't much outside of your standard uh, quote-unquote futuristic spaceship or uh, building models. 
The plots are also pretty conventional sci-fi stuff, just like the strips, but we do get an appearance by voice actor Rob Paulson, who plays the Mekon, Dan Dare's nemesis. The whole series is available uh, on YouTube if you want to check it out. Uh, I will post links in the description. On to something a little more familiar, <laughs> at least to North Americans, the puppet shows of Sylvia and Jerry Anderson. Now this puppetry, the Andersons' own brand of puppetry, was known as Super Marionation. What differentiated these puppets from regular marionettes was the fact that they used electronics to animate the character's mouth movements, which is similar to animatronics. The Andersons produce several TV series uh, with this technique. Relevant to our interests, we have 1961's Supercar, featuring a rocket-like car that could fly and travel underwater. Uh, some really great mid-century aesthetics here. Their next show, Fireball XL5, was set in 2062. It had a plot similar to Star Trek, where the crew of the titular ship policed the galaxy. Again, great aesthetics and uh, some ideas, including flying scooters, or I guess hover bikes. These special effects are amazing. Seeing what else was geared towards children at the time uh, just could not compete with the Anderson's work. As a quick aside, while we're on the subject, at the same time XL5 was airing, so was former Anderson collaborator Roberta Lee's Space Patrol, which used similar puppets on a similar theme with a much lower budget. I absolutely love Lee's City of the year 2100, but this is less cartoony, more serious, more scientific, but the puppets are less expressive. Uh, still interesting and worth checking out though. Again, links in description. In our Hanna-Barbera episode, we briefly talked about aquatic futurism, how the unconquered or unexplored sea could be habitable in the future. The Anderson Stingray ran with this idea, again, set in the 2060s, a century from time of production. This was more or less Fireball XL5 under the sea. The members of the World Aquanaut Security Patrol, or WASP, patrolled the oceans and engaged with underwater societies. When facing attack, cities above ground have an emergency mechanism where they lower beneath the surface, um, which I'm sure fans of Evangelion will recognize. Finally, we have Thunderbirds 1965. We once again get a rescue organization, this time International Rescue, led by industrialist Jeff Tracy. His sons pilot five different futuristic vehicles, dubbed Thunderbird 1 through 5, which are capable of traversing land, sea, and air. I actually wasn't going to include Thunderbirds, <laughs> because this series is huge, both conceptually and in its production. It is by far the Anderson's most ambitious work. Uh, there are numerous unique sets. As it takes place all over the globe, we get cities that appear once, uh, just for one episode. The nature of their production is also worth noting. Traditionally, their shows were shot, on average, an episode a week. Thunderbirds was twice the length or runtime of their previous shows, and to fit everything meant moving at double speed. This hard work did pay off though, and Thunderbirds would be the Anderson's most successful show. It would spawn sequels, as well as remakes, including an anime, Thunderbirds 2086. The Andersons would produce other shows as well, uh, but nothing hit the same heights as Thunderbirds. One last thing I found interesting is that the Andersons would promote their shows in a magazine called TV Century 21 after their production studio. This was published weekly and featured comics and information related to the shows, but was presented as if it were a newspaper from the future, uh, which I think is a really cool detail and uh, great uh, transmedia cross-promotion. Uh, yeah, that's about it for today. This was not meant to be exhaustive. I actually skipped over some things, like uh, Max Headroom, because I like to talk about that at length sometime in the future. Let me know if I missed anything else. If you enjoyed this video, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't. Uh, check out, also, some of the other episodes in the series. Uh, we must be coming up on about 20 episodes at this point, so lots of great stuff there. I mentioned Patreon earlier. We are 100% viewer-supported. I don't run ads. I don't want to. <laughs> I have designed the Patreon to basically be a whole other channel, similar but different, with its own series like Feature Film. $5 a month gets you access to that, as well as dozens of other videos. So if you like what we do and you want to see more, keep videos coming up more frequently, please consider becoming a patron, patreon.com slash portraits. As always, thank you so much for interest in this channel, and thanks for watching. See you in the future.